next presenter is uh, a writer and a computer publicist. He actually wrote the first personal computer article in the um, popular magazine Galaxia <laughs> in, in January of 1981, uh, Galaxia, sorry, Galaxia, um, which I believe is well known in, in uh, Serbia. And uh, uh, since then has been uh, co covering every aspect of technology. Please welcome to the stage Dejan Ristanovic. Okay, I'm Dejan Ristanovic. I'm editor in chief of PC Press uh, Computer Magazine, and I'm going to talk about the long and bumpy road we made to get to the internet here in Serbia. It is, I hope, an interesting thing because people take internet now for granted, but it wasn't that way. It all started in 1986, quite a long time ago, and we got at our university Vax Decknet machines, and this was my first email address in my life. But it was not very a powerful email address because I could only communicate with other people at the university and later at other parts of Yugoslavia, but not to the world. Then in 1989, we got BitNet connection. BitNet, now not very well known, is because it's time network and its European component was EARN. European Academic and Research Network. So somebody told us, you will now get real email addresses. You will have the ability to send emails to everywhere in the world, to the America. And we asked what? Yes, you can send an email, some text to a friend in America, and he will receive it in like five minutes. And how much does it cost? Well, it costs nothing. So where is the catch? There is no catch. Well, that, that can't happen. It's not, just not true. But once we understood it really is true, we really loved that and used it and even learned how to download encoded files from Trickle servers and it all was going well until 1992. Well, now I am really a geek and I really hate politics and I don't want to talk about politics, but just little politics here. In 1992, we had a war here, the country dissolved, and the whole world uh, decided that we Serbs are the bad guys. And as you know, the bad guys shouldn't have the internet access, so they cut us. So we had got nothing, no internet access, no email, nothing. Well, so we lived in a country under, under a blockade and we had to do all the work ourselves. Uh, the, the key to do that was uh, BBS. In November 1989, with one colleague, Mr. Zoran Životic, uh, under the computer magazine Računari, which means computers, I was editor there, uh, we started the BBS. It was at first small BBS, just one line BBS, but over time it grew to three lines, five lines, ten lines, fifteen lines, and became the largest BBS in Yugoslavia, which was not very difficult, but also in all this part of Balkan. Uh, it was a conference system run, running uh, using original software we developed, uh, and the main things with CESA were the conferences. There was conferences about computers, about communications, about lifestyle, culture, even politics. And people came there to talk about all that mostly, also to download some files because it was the only way to download new software, public domain and other. And uh, they had to pay some subscription about $80 per year, which was a lot of money at that time. So there was no, not much uh, digital photo uh, cameras and mobile phones at that time, so I don't have many photographs of Sesame BBS. This one was taken from some TV show where it was featured. 
at its glorious moments in 1994, I think, it used Compact Desk Pro Server, and it was, well, actually, it was a workstation that we call the server. Uh, it has 330 megabytes disk, and we, when people talked a lot, that disk became full, but we could not uh, acquire another disk that would fit Compaq. They needed some special disks, so we had to put another no-name PC with a gigabyte disk. It all ran under novel network. That were servers. Now each phone line was powered by one DOS computer. Uh, they're, they're mostly uh, outdated computers even by that time, but they were cheap and that, that was all we could get. So uh, every line was supported by one computer. They were uh, connected to a network and they communicated with the users using s by today's standards very slow modems. Uh, custom software was written in Microsoft C and Turbo Pascal and the staff included one system manager, two system administrators, about 12 moderators, one secretary and I don't know some three or four thousand users. Now in order to use SESAM you had to have a computer which was expensive and difficult to obtain in Serbia be able to connect the modem, uh, configure ports, configure the modem, uh, use communication program, read uh, and understand the manual. You know, this is the manual. It's about 200 pages of small print of how to use each of the commands. And uh, so pay $80 a year which was at some times uh, standard salaries were maybe ten dollars a month so it was a lot of money so we have successful technically able people and that was the secret of the success uh, people mostly talked on our bbs and here you can see the first five or four or five years people talks about computers and other subjects and you can see there was 140,000 messages in the best year. That's a lot. If you take total number of characters, you see how, how many characters people wrote and that was text only. We do, didn't have any multimedia. You couldn't embed some pictures in the text. It was only text people written. Now you can see 120 megabytes of text and that little little blue dot is the length of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So you see how much text people wrote. Of course that was not so interesting at Lord of the Rings but uh, you know it was a great quantity and uh, the average length of a message wants more than 100 characters. So compare it with some uh, messages now or Facebook would say, yo, great, go. So it was serious talk on many subjects. But of course we still needed the internet and here comes the hacking part. Uh, the phone was a, a way to, to contact the abroad destination but it was almost impossible to use because it was extremely expensive and besides the, the connections were lousy. So we found that they didn't cut a X25 network, postal network, which was called UPAC in Serbia, like Yugoslavia packet network, but it was 960 bits per second for a whole country, so it's not very fast, but by typing some username and password and this number you could get to Bix, for example, Bix was Byte Information Exchange of the BBS of the Byte magazine, famous. Log in there, pay their subscription, and really get a real email address. This was my, my first real email address. I could only send short messages. It was expensive, but it really worked. Or some people found another hack. They could 
connect to something called Audile. There were Audiles all over America. You co connect to the Audile using packet network and then dial a number in some area, for example, in the Virginia area, and connect to any BBS there. Is, if the BBS is free, then you can get some free uh, access and maybe send email or something. But of course, you have to pay uh, UPA costs. It was slow and expensive, but it worked. So people thought, well, let's use some tricks. Let's make it even easier. So they did things like this. You send on a VAX computer uh, a mail to this strange address. It says, well, go to using packet network to some system in Swiss and then send mail from there. If somebody wants to reply to you, he has to use other address to say, go to that uh, system and have it uh, mail the, ad the message to a recipient. Uh, it was expensive not only for us, but also for that systems and they didn't like it. This particular system had an administrator, I remember even Today, his name was Martin Winter, Sunshine on Pegasus BBS, and he said, well, what are you doing? You are using our resources. Why are you doing that? We said, well, you know, we are cut from the internet. We, this is the way to communicate with our friends in the world. And he said, okay, I cannot allow that, but I will stop looking. So, <laughs> so we use that a lot. This, he was a good man, so greetings to him wherever he is now. And now, finally, we found a real solution. One of our guys in California State University decided to route all the email to Serbia from his office computer. He had uh, a computer in his office, uh, and he put some mailer on it, and we had strange email addresses like this, but it really worked. And our friends of the university made it work by on the School of Electrical Engineering, a faculty of organizational scientists. They mm, wrote some custom software that use all the tricks to using our dials, using other means to uh, deliver the mail, receive the email, distribute that email using UCP protocol to, to uh, other computers in uh, Serbia. And that system was slow, but it really worked. It was also expensive, but we had money at the time. You see one of the... <laughs> One of the notes, uh, we had many of these. So actually, if you wait a bit to pay your phone bill, however big your phone bill is, it will, it will not be much money because when this banknote was published, it was worth like $2. A week later, it was worth like 10 cents. So if you wait a week, then the bill goes down. And finally, you know, we lost all the wars, so we were still the bad guys. But you know, we were defeated bad guys, and defeated bad guys could have internet access, but it has to be slow. So we got uh, one satellite link. It was 64 kilobits per second for complete country, believe it or not, done by the University of Belgrade, one company and one bank. And it was a beginning. 1996 was a wonderful year for internet in Serbia. Sometime later, we had terrestrial links, we had multiple pr providers, and we finally got to the internet. Even our SESAM went pro. Instead of home-built PCs, we used professional equipment. We offered full internet access, more dial-in phone lines, we ported our software to the 32-bit platform using NT servers, and we became one of the important internet providers. 
But even more importantly, a social network was born, a social network of users. And I have here a few lines from a Wired article published in April 1997, I think. It was called The Internet Revolution in Belgrade. It was about how the users of Sesame BBS uh, used the internet to uh, oppress the repressive government and fight for their freedom. And as you can see, it, uh, David Kohl was one of the three main points linked in Serbia to the net and the outside world. And uh, he said that uh, organizing this protest, a culture without whose cooperation and support the internet would not exist as a political weapon. So we came to the politics again. But it were important times and eventually the repressive regime was outthrown in, 19, in 200, 2000 year. Uh, in the, we had to come to the millennia in, without repressive regime. Well, what happened next? Everything was much easier, but somehow complicated at the same time. We got broadband five years later. We have ADSL and cable internet. We get mobile networks, e-banking, e-commerce, global corporation offer their equipment and services. Our SESAM was acquired by a certain investment fund. It is now an important internet provider. And the conference system still exists. Not, it is not used much, but it exists. It, we moved it to a, a virtual machine, and anybody can still telnet and access all those conferences and messages. And, but the, which is much more important, SESAM users are scattered around the world and still communicated one way or the an another using multiple means. They all remember it with happy thoughts. And you know, life is a journey, not a destination. It was a great journey. I was proud to be a part of it. And it's be the best part of my life. Thank you. <laughs>